So the next session is about uh, what we could describe as a figure of merit of quantum computing. That it's the energetic aspect. And there are three ways to cover this, uh, this aspect. Uh, yeah. The two first way are to look at the uh, eventual uh, energetic advantage of quantum computing. The second is, uh, do we have energy constraints? I mean, uh, uh, limiting, for example, the way we can scale with uh, qubits, uh, like a silicon qubit or a superconducting qubit. And the last one, which will be covered in another panel, is, uh, is there a, a set of applications of quantum computing in the energy business? And this is, will be covered by El Elvira Shishenina in uh, the application panel uh, in the afternoon. So we will cover the two first issues. For that, we have uh, an excellent panel of uh, four uh, scientists. Uh, I will start with covering the, their own uh, bio. So we will start with, uh, we will have Wikun Ng. She's from Singapore. So she's uh, working at the famous uh, uh, CQT uh, Center uh, in Singapore. Uh, she leads the research group uh, focused on uh, theoretical aspects of quantum computation, uh, particularly uh, on error correction and uh, large scale computing and fault tolerance. She's also working in a joint Franco French uh, Singaporean lab called Majulab with CNRS. And by the way, she did her PhD uh, in uh, the group of John Preskill at Caltech. We, we love to have this uh, uh, famous scientist being uh, uh, the godfather <laughs> on their own of, uh, of you uh, as the speakers. Then we have David Gunnarsson. He's the chief science officer of Bufors, uh, one of the leading uh, uh, cryogenic companies uh, serving various markets, but including the market of uh, quantum computing. He, he's been there for a couple of years. He's got a PhD from Chalmers uh, for his work on the Josephson Junction uh, based quantum qubit. So he's got a broad knowledge of quantum computing. And uh, he's uh, in a company which has a fairly good size. I mean, uh, sold 1,600 systems and more than 200 people. Um, so it's going to cover, of course, the cryogenic uh, aspects of quantum computing. Then we will have also Stefan Tanguy. He's the CTO and CIO of EDF R&D. And uh, his profile is interesting because in his team uh, of uh, research people, he's uh, doing both investments in the quantum uh, computing software uh, area. So he's trying to uh, create new software and new algorithms to, that can be useful for the business of EDF. But on the other hand, he's uh, doing a lot of uh, simulation, classical simulation on the supercomputers. And so he can give us a kind of broad perspective on the, the potential quantum advantage and energetical quantum advantage of quantum computing. And uh, last but not least, uh, and we will start with her, we've got Alexia Ofev. I don't know if uh, I can see her. <laughs> can we see? Uh, the speakers in the videos, I, I don't see any videos, but whatever. So Alexia, welcome. So <laughs> finally, uh, so Alexia, you are director of research at CNRS Institute in, in Grenoble, the same place where Tristan Meunier is working. Uh, we heard him uh, before. You've got a wealthy background, a PhD in photonics with Serge Arroche, a Nobel Prize. And more recently, you decided to focus on the, the fundamental aspects of thermodynamics in quantum computing and quantum physics uh, overall. And uh, we'll hear about you in another role later because you're coordinating uh, the quantum engineering in Grenoble uh, ecosystem. Olivier, but here, we need to let our panelists yeah, talk of course. as well. <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll start with Alexia. And so, Alexia, you are, uh, you'll start explaining uh, what is this topic of energy uh, and scalability with quantum computing. And you've got a couple of slides. I, I hope we're going to see that. Um, can we see the first slide of Alexia? Uh, as far as I'm concerned. No, you don't control anything. <laughs> I go <laughs> back, I don't. Yes, uh, here we are. He's out of control. <laughs> here we are, we've got the slides. So yeah, great. you can start, Alexia. So, yeah. Welcome. Thanks for the introduction. And, and also, thank you for allowing me to, to try to frame a little bit this panel uh, with these few slides, because it's, it's true that it's been a, a couple of years that uh, in Grenoble, we are starting to set up this uh, research lead, which is both fundamental and also with strong engineering aspects about the, the power consumption of, of quantum computers. And um, it can all start with a very simple question. Do quantum computers uh, consume more or less power than a classical computer? And if you think in an optimistic and ideal way, uh, you can think that a quantum algorithm will consume less power because uh, you lower the complexity, so it's a software argument, and also you use logically reversible gates, and using this kind of gates should also allow you to, to save energy. 
But the fact is that this ideal way of thinking, which talks in favor of a, of a quantum advantage, is actually considering noise-free scenario. And so now you have to click and and uh, and yeah. put the the yeah. So uh, actually, if you consider the, the the practical side of things, so we all know that uh, if we want to implement a quantum computation, uh, we have to fight against noise, and fighting against noise costs energy uh, by essence. And uh, typically, uh, you have to put, for instance, your your qubits into a, a cryostat. And uh, you know that you are going to use many, many qubits. Uh, typically, one logical qubit uh, will count like from 100 to 1 million of, of physical qubits. So you, you can ask the question, but in the real life, what will be the real energy scaling laws if we want to, to, to realize the large scale fault tolerant quantum computer? So uh, next slide, please. So. Um, this question, it, it raises lots of challenge. And actually, if you look at the technology that we use today, especially to control qubits, uh, we are in bad shape and we are going to have to work. Because today, uh, we are generating microwaves, uh, so the signal that controls the qubits. And uh, the control electronics, it's all at room temperature. And this uh, has to communicate with uh, the chipset that is inside the cryostat. This leads to huge amount of heat dissipation because of conduction losses, because of the attenuators that we put on the way. And obviously, this can translate into a huge cryogenic cost. So there is the, the little formula at the bottom of the slide with a very nice magnification factor that is the rate of temperature, the external temperature divided by the internal temperature of the cryostat, uh, and also the cryogenic uh, yield, uh, which is uh, typically 100 for the best cryostat these days, but I guess we are going to discuss that uh, during this panel. So uh, we have to improve that. So next slide, please. Um, and and uh, people are already thinking about tomorrow. And this, uh, Tristan said it uh, very well in the, in the previous panel. Uh, we think about putting uh, on chip uh, everything that deals with the control, uh, typically the microwave generation, the readout electronics, and uh, possibly as well, so he did not mention that, but this can be a dream as well to do on chip error correction. Uh, with this, uh, we solve the problem of, uh, say, input output interconnects, uh, but we still have the problem of information, classical information processing. Uh, cryoelectronics, these days, the best projection, uh, let us think that there should be typically a power consumption of 100 microwatts per physical qubits. So now if you do the little math, you think about having a, a logical qubit that counts like 1 million physical qubits, and then you multiply by the magnification factor, which is the rate of temperatures. You multiply by the efficiency, the, the yield of the cooling, uh, and you quickly arrive to huge amount of power that would be spent per logical qubit. So all this to say that it's not a fatality, but it's just that energy uh, becomes a figure of merit, uh, just as density of qubits or uh, fidelity of qubits or level of noise, it becomes uh, an intrinsic uh, figure of med merit that we should consider on the road to scalability. Next slide, please. And uh, fortunately, we already have a solution in view. Uh, and this is very good because all these solutions, all these challenges that people, they will have to, to, uh, to, to, to overcome, uh, to realize uh, they will actually be a very nice combination of engineering and fundamental research. That's what quantum engineering is. For, so here are a few of the solutions or the, the research leads that we can consider to, to make uh, energy uh, something scalable. Uh, on the hardware side, uh, we need to, as Tristan said, we need to increase the operating temperature. We need to lower the noise level, engineer good qubits, and possibly uh, really do qubit engineering, just like in the case of, uh, of the cat qubits, for instance. We need to work on the cryogeny uh, forefront, uh, improve the cooling efficiencies, uh, lower the conduction losses. We can also work on the 
information, classical information processing side. And this will be a major uh, challenge in the, in the next years. The fact that actually um, a quantum information, a quantum bit has a natural dressing with classical information. And if we want to do energetically scalable quantum computers, we need to have also scalable classical energy. Uh, and for this, there are uh, new research leads that are opening on the side of uh, adiabatic and reversible computing. This is what people call the, re the beyond Landauer paradigm. We can also think about uh, autonomous processes, so on chip error correction, basically. There is work on the side of the architecture. We want to minimize the number of wires that communicate between the chipset and the external world. So this has to see with the code connectivity, with the qubits addressing. And of course, uh, there is uh, deep, hardcore fundamental physics, which has to do with the energetic bounds. The fact that uh, when you have removed all the practical uh, sources of, of power dissipation, you are stuck with the minimal power that you should spend, for instance, in the presence of a certain level of noise, uh, or the minimal amount of power that you should spend to cool down uh, a quantum chipset. So that's it. Um, I hope I didn't take much time. Um, no, it was uh, perfect. Uh, less than 10 minutes, so it's, it's excellent. So if I summarize what you said and uh, the, the remainder of the, run the, the panel discussion is we will cover the hardware part with Wikun. We'll cover the cryogenic aspect with uh, uh, our colleague from um, uh, David Narson from uh, Blue Force. And we'll come back to you maybe for adiabatic and reversible computing and maybe all the technologies involved. And in the end, we will ask uh, uh, Stefan Tanguy from EDF to talk about this from a very global view of the customer, the viewpoint of the customer. So we can, uh, we are with you now, I hope it works. Uh, so we are in Singapore. So another time zone for today's conference. Can we see uh, Wikun, please? Oh, welcome. Here you are. I don't hear you, so maybe. Uh, I don't hear Wikun, so can we get the sound from Wikun? So Wikun is in Singapore in the CQT, back for those who were not at the beginning of the, the panel discussion. Um, and she's going to explain us what are the, the impact of those limited available resources in, uh, in quantum computing and uh, how this can be addressed. So it looks like she can listen, she can hear me. That's good. It's a good sign. But the other way around is not working. So um, can you activate your mic? I, I don't know. I ask a stupid question, but. Uh, but maybe we can may go to David to ask this question why they're trying to fix. To David? I don't know. Uh, it depends on uh, how long will it take to fix that. If it's too long, we can switch to David. Uh, yeah. So, David was going to talk about the scalability to enable technology. Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. We can, we can so, okay, we switch to David. Hi, David. How are you? Um, so, how about cryogenic? Can it help scale those uh, qubits? I mean, at least the superconducting qubits and the silicon qubits. How can you help? No, so I think. Uh, to start, it's of course nice to say where we are with cryogenics at the moment. There was quite a lot of uh, uh, things that on the previous slides. Uh, and I think I had a slide that I can use as a basis. Yep. I'm showing the slide. I don't know if it shows up. Can we show the last slide of the deck, please? Here we are. That's the right one. Yep. Thank you. No, so I think just to start, uh, what do we have today and what is the cryogenic systems that we are talking about? And uh, I use this slide to sort of give a little bit of support to that. So this is uh, the systems that Blueforce are making are scientific instruments that helps you to do measurement at extremely low temperatures, a few thousands above absolute zero. And uh, in the middle here, you see a typical example of this and it has cascaded coolers helping you to actually reach these lowest temperatures. So it's actually not only one cooler, there is several stages with different cooling powers and different temperatures. And I think that's important when we continue the discussion. Um, if you look at Blue Force in general, of course, we have grown as a company the last 10 years. 
quite a lot due to the quantum technology growth as well, because that, of course, the systems 10 years ago became easier and more accessible to users. And a lot of research have been done based on cryogenic electronics and quantum technology. So that's, I think, where we are today. We have grown these 10 years, improved our system to make them more adapted to the different experiments that people actually want to do. And quantum computing is one of them. And, and there, I think, we specifically has focused quite a lot on improving the cooling power and also improving the measurement infrastructure to actually make it possible to, to address more qubits and also handle the thermal, thermal budget that you actually is limited, like Alexia mentioned in the previous speech. So I think that, that tells a little bit where Blue Force is. And of course, the demand, these systems are fairly easy to sort of scale, scale because they are small. We can actually produce them in our factory, test them and send them out to customers. So for the time being, cryogenics is fairly easy and accessible for customers to get. And this uh, system to the right there, it has the capability and cooling power to house 500 to 1000 physical qubits if we use the same methods that are used today, more or less. There is, of course, certain improvements needed to be made, but that is the order of magnitude at the moment. Uh, one thing that I also just wanted to mention is that, of course, it's not only about the quantum computer operation itself, it's also to get the quantum circuits that you need in your system. And for that, at least for superconducting and spin qubits, there's a lot of microfabrication that needs to be qualified and characterized. So there is also a need to support cryogenics in the manufacturing of these quantum circuits. So the way people use, do this today is that they use our traditional R&D setups and do thermal cyclings and testing chip one by one, more or less. So to increase that throughput, Bluefors has worked together with a partner, Afora, who is specialized in uh, wafer probers, and we made a cryogenic wafer prober. And this one, we believe, can help speed up at least the circuit fabrication and making higher quality systems for, for, for the quantum computing community about the, the, the big device you've got on the left, so for testing wafers. Is there yes. a technology in that seemingly big device that can be reused in a quantum computing cryostar, or is it completely different technology for with regards to temperature or other aspects? So the temperature is slightly higher, but in principle, there is nothing stopping you from also go to the lower temperature in that type of system. So this is maybe one sort of a way to linearly scale a quantum computer when you reach a limit that you actually, you hook up several systems. But of course, it's not a very economical way to school, economical way to scale a quantum computer since you will gain factors of two, two or three, depending on how many systems you put together. But this is one way to sort of have, have sort of a bigger, experimental space and also having more access to your experiment. Uh, can you remind us about the power budget for each of these devices, just so that we have an indication? Yes, so it's important maybe to sort of talk about, when we talk about cooling power, you should also talk about temperature because of it's course. not scaling one to one. To, so for in the superconducting qubit case, you would like to operate at tens of millikelvin. So that of course means that down here, which is the lowest stage, you maybe have 10 to 100 microwatt to work with. And that of course is from the previous slide, 100 microwatt per qubit, that means that you can in principle not operate one qubit. But it of course depends on where you dissipate that power. So each stage here have a cascaded temperature and cooling power. So, uh, and these are, fairly generic measurement system at the moment. And I think there's a lot to be done to optimize that. So where, where do your qubit control take the power out? Because if you can take it out up at one Kelvin, you actually can 
you, you have 10,000 times more cooling power than if you need to take it out down at 20 millikelvin. But my question was also related uh, on, yeah. on the total power budget for cooling the system. So it's in kilowatts. I mean, uh, the input power, you were talking about the cooling power, but the, the, the total consumption power is fairly significant. And people are kind of afraid of that level. Should we be afraid of that level of power that's needed for cooling the system or not? I think it, it's, of course, an important aspect, but the question, I think it's not the biggest problem at the moment. Of course, getting one million qubits is much harder than spending a megawatt to, to operate it if it has the uh, advantage over other computation. Because if you go to a big uh, supercomputer uh, system, that, of course, consumes quite a lot of power as well. So I think it, it's important to see where where the optimization and crossover is there. But you can, of course, improve the current systems, maybe maximum a factor of 10 when it comes to the input power compared to the output power. OK, That's thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to come back to Wikun. I, I hope it works now. Uh, we should hear her. I will also show the slide of her uh, preliminary talk. Can we hear you? Hi. Ah. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yeah, good news. <laughs> so, okay, uh, you were supposed to follow up on Alexia's presentation, so uh, you're, you're going to talk about uh, what are the fundamental limits that we have to overcome to create those scalable uh, quantum computers, and that's where, mm -hmm. that's the focus of your work uh, in Singapore. So, tell us about this. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much for having me at this event. Um, I mean, I think, uh, the main thing about uh, trying to scale up is really, I think as Alexia and I'm sure many of the other speakers before me have already talked about, is the control of the noise. Okay, And the most important thing in order for you to be able to control the noise, of course, you have the fundamental experimental design, the engineering design that goes with every single device. But there is always going to be uh, a limit to how far you can go with the bare qubits, the bare physical qubits that you have in your devices. Okay, And then from then on, once you have reached that limit, in order for you to then talk about scaling up to large scale computers, and you want your computers to be uh, useful, you want them to be accurate. The only way we know how to in fact go towards uh, improving the accuracy of our quantum computers and get to large scale quantum computers is uh, something that's called uh, fault tolerant quantum computing. Okay? And essentially what that means is simply that you have a set of methods that allow you to invest more physical resources. Okay? Uh, I'll come back to what kind of physical resources in a moment, but you invest more physical resources to try to remove the residual errors that is left uh, in your physical system. Okay? Without the ability to remove those errors, when you scale up, the errors accumulate. In the end, you're going to wind up with a quantum computation that is essentially useless. You have so many errors, so many incorrect calculations, that's the answer that you get is not at all what you would expect. Uh, from a, a correct calculation of the um, algorithm, yeah. So in that sense, um, the so to, in order to to have this fault tolerant quantum computing, you need to invest more resources, and more resources means more qubits, more energy to cool to run the gates. Um, you need more time for the computation. You need more classical computation to actually control what you do in the error correction. The more you have uh, in terms of physical resources you invest in this, the better correction you can have, the more errors you can uh, remove, the more noise you can tolerate, and then your computer is actually more and more accurate. So as far as we understand today, given uh, what we know about fault tolerant quantum computing, if you have any kind of a limitation for the uh, physical resources in your system, you're not going to be able to, uh, you're going to reach a limit in how accurate your cal calculation is going to be. You're going to reach a limit to how large scale a uh, quantum computer you can actually build. Yeah. Okay, so we come back to all this uh, challenging question of scalability and enabling technology, but maybe we can switch a gear a little bit and go to the particular use cases. We are lucky to have Stefan, the CTO and CIO of ODF with us. Maybe Stefan, you can 
kick off with telling us a little bit in the um, early application that you have been trying to do, have you seen any advantage regarding quantum energy and the cost that you have been playing already as an end user in this uh, domain? Yeah, hi. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, okay. Thanks for <clears throat> having me participate into this uh, very interesting event first. Um, so, yeah, just to give you a little bit of background, and Olivier um, made a, a small introduction on that. Um, uh, we do a lot of uh, simulation at uh, EDF uh, research and development, so um, that's used typically to use uh, to address some of the key challenges of um, the, the future of the electrical system. So um, we have invested in our own uh, computing capacity in terms of high performance computing and um, um, in, um, in the beginning of the next year will be just to give you an order of magnitude we'll be running nine petaflops of uh, computing capacity. And uh, that takes about two megawatt of power uh, basically to, uh, to run. So, well, you might think uh, you know, EDF, you're not paying the bill, you're providing the electrons. In fact, that's not true. We have to pay our bill by regulation. So that's, that's a kind of a, a cost, obviously, but also we're pretty conscious in terms of uh, our literary electricity consumption. Uh, so classical consumption uh, computing isn't very uh, efficient from that standpoint. It takes about one third of this electricity is used basically to cool uh, the computing and the storage of, of the system. And, and I think although there's been a lot of progress on that, that's still of an issue. So we definitely uh, see quantum computing as an opportunity to gain in terms of energy computing efficiency. I would say that uh, to answer directly uh, the question of uh, the advantage that, that we'll be able to observe today, I think it's a bit too soon to call today from our perspective. Um, we, we still, um, you know, developing our program and running the experiment on a simulated environment like the, the quantum uh, learning machine from Atos, for example. <clears throat> Uh, this being said, um, uh, what we, we definitely want to do, um, just to give you an example of use cases we're running, um, we want to better understand how um, material will be aging. Um, and typically, we want to understand how magnetic metals will be aging when they're exposed to uh, radiation, for example. So, in order to be able to get the level of precision that we want on this type of uh, calculation and computation, we would need uh, typically 100 to 1,000 extra uh, times the capacity that we can run today uh, with our current uh, capacity on classical computing on HPC. So doing that will be, be extremely closely from a R&D budget perspective. And uh, what we'll be looking at definitely now is um, uh, by uh, simulating those computation with um, a quantum algorithm to be able to understand what level of logical qubit we would need uh, in, in, in effect to reach that level of precision that we cannot get today with uh, classical computing. Uh, that's one example. Another example is um, the one that uh, one of your previous uh, speaker from Pascal mentioned, Adrian, I think was his name. Uh, we're conducting some work with them to model what we call smart charging of electrical vehicles. So um, when uh, we'll have millions of uh, electric vehicles on the street uh, in a couple of years, um, there will be a numbers of optimization, hard optimization problem that uh, we would have to cope with if we don't want to have uh, to cope with a peak of demand that will be destabilizing the, the grid. Um, so we would need to basically um, prioritize, minimize the prioritized charging. We would need to uh, orchestrate of uh, group charging and constraint. And those are uh, uh, NP-complex problems that uh, we will be looking to solve using the uh, cold atom machine from, uh, from, from, from Pascal. So again, here, um, we will need to go further down the uh, experimentation and the, uh, the, the, the implementation of those algorithms basically to understand what is the, uh, the, the, the power load for, for those. 
Okay, so maybe I just follow up on that, uh, particularly uh, link with the question from the chat that essentially say how much does it cost uh, eventually when we want to put all those elements that is discussed regarding uh, necessary hardware. So essentially in big question, when do you think we can assess the potential economic impact, taking to account the cost, the energy advantage that we might get, the quantum advantage that we might get. So where do you see that this concrete uh, economical uh, benefit will come? Well, so we, we, we have launched a couple of uh, PhD uh, to run this problem. As you know, those, are, uh, those aren't uh, uh, simple problems. So, but we definitely hope that uh, in the time frame of those uh, PhD, so in a couple of years, we'll be able uh, basically to better understand effectively those, those questions and be able to say effectively there will be a economic impact a saving basically will run a, a quantum advantage and what will be the energy advantage derived specifically on our problem i think uh, we, we're not looking at uh, you know uh, understanding basically the general um, quantum supremacy uh, we were looking at uh, the specific use cases that makes sense for our industry. And that's the very reason why we are investing R&D budget in those fields is that uh, we wanna be able to focus the effort on uh, the very specific algorithm, a sort of algorithm and type of algorithm and technology that will provide the advantage for us. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to the uh, technological challenges uh, of energy scalability. Can we move back to Alexia? I want to be sure uh, she's online and we can hear her. I'm still around. Oh, okay, you're still around, excellent. So uh, coming back to the scalability technologies, uh, I know you're passionate about uh, talking uh, about this quantum uh, engineering uh, challenges we, we have to face. Tristan mentioned that, by the way, when he talked about the qubits, but you think that uh, addressing those energy uh, aspects of quantum computing is an engineering challenge. So can you elaborate on that and what kind of disciplines we have to it's, collaborate? It's a quantum engineering challenge. So I, I mm. will, I, I will uh, milden a little bit the, the formulation because uh, uh, and we are going to rediscuss that tonight for for the discussion on ecosystems, right? The fact yep. that quantum engineering is a, is a is an alliage, it's a, it's a mix, uh, it's an entanglement of fundamental research and, and engineering. And if you remove one, it doesn't work anymore. So, um, as far as uh, these uh, energetic challenges are concerned, uh, indeed, there are many practical questions that have to be solved. Uh, the wire dissipation, uh, something that doesn't touch really on the, on the fundamental uh, physics. But on the other hand, on the fundamental physics part, uh, what you will find is the minimal energy that you should spend, for instance, to run a gate in the presence of noise. And this, uh, why is that so fundamental? It's because it, uh, it mixes the energetic expense and also the irreversibility of the process. So basically you have, uh, you can see how the arrow of time, uh, to, to say big words, uh, will influence uh, the energetic cost of your computation. And this is actually very specific to thermodynamics. Thermodynamics started in the 19th as an engineer science, and it gave the arrow of time. So that's what I have in mind when I talk mm. about quantum engineering, something where really the, the blue sky research and uh, the applied stuff, they go together uh, hand in hand. OK, C could you mention the, the labs in the world or even the companies who are trying to address the problems you, you describe, the challenges and the solutions. Uh, I know you know many of them, so can you cover the yeah. worldwide uh, perspective well, of actually that? Well, it's, actually, it's, it's a recent discovery if, if you talk about this reversible computing uh, stuff, which indeed is something I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on because the, there is time arrow and at the same time something that may uh, save the energy of, of a calculation. Um, so I, I would say the heart is Sandia Labs uh, with Mike Frank uh, that is uh, gathering around him a, a bigger and bigger community around these ideas of classical reversible computing uh, with uh, new technologies that uh, could be used and typically inside the quantum computer to uh, work for the control of the qubits. 
So I'm, I'm thinking about uh, RSQF, like this uh, rapid flux, uh, single flux quanta, uh, adiabatic uh, superconducting uh, technologies, spintronics. So all these people, uh, they started, they, they start to, to discuss together about uh, how to bring that on the research development uh, community. So I would say there are not yet companies uh, on that, but uh, it's a matter of short time scale, I would say. Uh, do, do we have also uh, people working in the electronics uh, business? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, control electronics CMOS. as well, cryo CMOS? Adiabatic so CMOS, absolutely. Do, do we have uh, such teams in France working on those aspects? Um, ah. Not far from so you, that's right? a good, not far from you. That's maybe, a good no? question. I know that uh, at Leti, uh, they, they have started to look at uh, adiabatic CMOS uh, problematics. Yep. Um, and um, well, that's a trend to, to, to improve, I would say. Okay, uh, thank you, Alexia. And we will finish with Wikun uh, back in Singapore. I hope it still works. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can we have uh, Wikun? So, could you elaborate a little bit on the, the way in your uh, research center you, you prioritize the research to address these LSQ and uh, uh, challenges? Meaning, you have probably uh, very fundamental research, uh, e which may be long term. Maybe you have a more applied research. Mm -hmm. We can have a shorter term impact. How are you balancing those investments and what can you say about mm -hmm. this? Yeah, so. Um, the longer term research of uh, trying to scale up, trying to think about fault tolerant uh, approaches to quantum computing, that's necessary uh, in order for you to eventually get to uh, useful quantum computers. I always emphasize this thing about useful so that it comes with the accuracy, right? But you don't get there in one giant leap, okay? No one is going to be able to do that. The shorter term, the nearer term things, uh, like uh, looking at NISC devices, looking at things that you can really do with those current devices. It may not be um, the best quantum advantage uh, kind of problems that you are going to be able to address eventually with the large scale computers, but they are, however, necessary steps for us to learn how to go beyond the current scale. Okay, so very much at uh, CQT at the Center of Quantum Technologies, there's sort of both sides of this. Um, where you have people really working on long-term things, like what I do. Um, you have uh, computer scientists thinking about what you can actually do with those large-scale quantum computers when you have the, uh, the, you design the algorithms that can actually make use of those large-scale quantum computers. But you also have very short-term uh, people who are thinking about building superconducting qubits uh, really to learn, learn about the noise, to learn about what is it that we need to do to go beyond the current things, okay? And a lot of those uh, nearer term work, um, of course, because I always get asked this question about uh, exactly what kind of qubit should we go for that has the longest, uh, that has the eventual ability to scale up, scale up into large scale quantum computers, but I think um, we don't quite know the answer yet, and the only way to find those answers is to think about these near-term devices. Right? So we have uh, quite a number of people who are really thinking of that question, and you use that as a learning tool okay, in order for us to eventually reach this ultimate goal of having a large-scale use of quantum computers. There was one question from the audience, uh, many uh, actually, but uh, one was, uh, can we say that the uh, energical consumption would be an advantage for photonic qubits? Maybe Alexia, because you're, you're, you were initially specialized in photonics. What could you say about this, if you're still online? Well, am I, am I around? Yes, uh, we can hear you and we see you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd say it's, it's on my personal roadmap, but uh, unfortunately I haven't, uh, took the time yet to, to really compute uh, what will be uh, what will be the energetics of single qubit gates and two qubit gates. Uh, I, I'd say it's much more obvious what has to be done in the case of superconducting qubits and, uh, and, and silicon qubits, uh, because we see that uh, there will be resonant gate and we can compute the energy that is provided by the, the driving field and stuff. Uh, for photons, when you have uh, gates that are done by polarizers, it's, it's more difficult to, to, uh, 
to, to do the, the thermodynamic analysis, uh, plain and simple. So, but that's on, that's on the way. I know you're working on that and uh, so not surprisingly, there was another question saying, how are the energy requirements different across all the kinds of qubits? So up to you for next year's QCB. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you, Alexia. Thank you, Wikun. Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Uh, we are nearly back on time. Uh, and uh, for all of us, all of you that who are following the conferences, uh, we'll be back at 2.30 uh, Paris time, uh, CET. Uh, so enjoy your lunch. Maybe some coffee. It may be useful as well. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Um, for the remainder of the day, where are we going to cover a lot of stuff? And we start with a, a keynote of the CEO from the CEO of Atos, Elie Girard. Then uh, a lot of stuff on applications. We're going to have Jordanis Kerenidis. Uh, we're going to have Jeremy O'Brien, the famous guy who raised more than 500 million bucks to fund C Quantum. So you're going to meet for a couple of surprises uh, for the remainder of this day. So have a good lunch. See you later. <laughs>